So without uh, further ado, are there any questions, uh, comments? Good. I should just jump straight into introducing our very first speaker. Jeffrey Green, you want to join me? <laughs> Jeffrey Green is uh, Janice and Julian Burr's assistant professor in the social sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a democratic theorist with very broad interests in ancient and modern political philosophy and contemporary social theory. Green is the author of the book The Eyes of the People, Democracy in an Age of Spectatorship, OUP 2010, which was awarded the first book prize from the Foundations of Political Theory section of the American Political Science Association. His current book project, about which we'll hear a bit more in a minute, is entitled The Plebeian Addendum to Liberal Democracy. And there he develops the idea of plebeianism as a way to better comprehend the nature of democracy and liberal, and particularly contemporary liberal democracy. Green taught previously at Harvard University and at Gothenburg University in Sweden. In 2013, he received Penn's Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching by an Assistant Professor. Uh, Jeff holds a BA summa cum laude from Yale University and a JD from Yale Law School as well as a PhD from Harvard. Jeff, it's an enormous pleasure to welcome you here and I look forward to hearing you talk about your paper. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you, Matthias and Irini, and the other organiza organizers of this uh, conference um, for inviting me here. I'm delighted to be here, and um, I've had a chance to, to read the other papers, and I've already had my understanding of spectatorship and its relationship to democracy altered, and I think indeed furthered, uh, by the other uh, contributors to this event, and so I'm very grateful for that. And I'm grateful as well in advance for any uh, critical suggestions I might receive here. Um, my paper for this conference uh, is from my final chapter of my, my second book, uh, which will be out at the end of next year, and I'm very much in the process still of revising, especially this, this part. Uh, and so uh, thank you very much for this chance for me uh, to continue to develop uh, an ongoing project. Um, I'd like to begin by um, reflecting on, on two important uh, background ideas uh, that I think inform this paper and speak to the uh, concerns of this conference. Um, uh, the first has to do with how we might consider the relationship of uh, spectatorship to democracy, just thinking generally about the issue. Uh, I agree very much with the premise of this workshop as it's stated uh, in the circular <coughs> that was distributed, that spectatorship is not only a fact that we have to confront in our politics, but a problem. It's a problem. There is, after all, a um, tension between democratic ideals of participa participation, equality, inclusivity on the one hand, and spectatorship, which carries with it a sense of hierarchy, a sense of passivity, and a sense of marginalization. And so how do we deal with this problem of, uh, of, of spectatorship and its relationship to democracy? In, in this first point I want to make, I'd like to distinguish three different avenues for addressing the problem. Uh, the first of which I take to be the most familiar and the most common, which is to try to uh, do what we can to uh, erase uh, the distance between the spectator and the political elite, erase the distance between spectators and politicians on the public stage, or at least limit this distance by making liberal democracies uh, uh, as inclusive and as genuinely representative as they can be. And so here the idea would be if we could have, say, uh, a well-ordered electoral system, uh, if we could have public opinion effectively hold leaders accountable and responsive, uh, then um, it doesn't matter so much that spectators are spectators and political elites are political elites because elections and public opinion are going to hold them, uh, make their decisions uh, result from the underlying preferences and values of the electorate. I would also include in this first familiar response uh, more radical solutions such as that put forward by 
uh, Carol Gould, who will be speaking here today, which calls for uh, counteracting structural problems, such as the effect that economic inequality has on political participation. Insofar as we live in times of great economic inequality and insofar as uh, this inequality leads to plutocratic consequences <coughs> with regard to political participation, if we can reduce those structural inequalities, well then here too we can soften the blow of spectatorship by having our democracies not just be organized according to well, well set up elections and, and effective public opinion, but also uh, social policies that, that, that do what they can to limit the effects of socioeconomic class on opportunity for political engagement. Now, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. I think that these ambitions are essential, and I in no way want to oppose them, but I do not believe that they can solve fully the problem of spectatorship. I think, first of all, you still have this issue of enormous scale, that in polities of, of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, I don't see how we can escape a situation where ordinary citizens are consigned to play the role of spectator. Further, as much as I would support um, well-organized elections and, and effective public opinion, I think that there are limits to how well these institutions can uh, go in counteracting spectatorship. For one thing, they seem to constitute spectatorship as much as they try to organize it. I mean, to, to vote and not run for office, to have an opinion but not make an actual decision, these are things that spectators do. And furthermore, I think that there's always been something mystical and not quite verifiable about the idea of representation. We're never fully sure when we are or are not being represented, and there's so much dispute about measuring representation that I don't think we can fully expect the problem of spectatorship to be solved through representative institutions. And as much as I would support efforts to reduce economic inequality and to reduce the effects of class in politics, I believe, and this might be a place where I differ from Carol Gould, that there are inevitable limits to how far we can go in preventing economic <coughs> inequality from intruding upon political opportunity and educational opportunity. That we're never going to get entirely away from what I call a shadow of unfairness, where at least to some degree, even in the most progressive, well-organized liberal democracies, the wealthier people have on average greater opportunities for political life. Um, and so for all of these reasons, scale, the limits of representative institutions, and the inescapable element of plutocracy, I don't think this first order level of solutions to the problem of spectatorship can be the full answer. Um, I think a second level of, of answering the problem of spectatorship would look not simply to shrink the distance between spectators and political actors, but to put special burdens on those being watched. In my first book, I argued that it's democratic to want political elites to appear in public under conditions they don't control. And in my second book, I'm arguing that it's a condition of demo democracy for economic elites to be identified and specially regulated. And I think in both respects, these are ideals that approach the problem of spectatorship in a different way. Again, not by achieving representation, not by shrinking the distance between spectators and spectated, but by expecting as a condition of democracy that the few whether the political elites or the economic elites, um, have special um, burdens placed upon them as a condition of being in a democratic society. Uh, but here, too, I do not think that uh, this level of solution can be complete, can solve the problem of spectatorship. Um, first of all, uh, I think that um, uh, the, the very frustrations for which we would want some public compensation in the form of burdening the few will not go away as a result of those burdens. And second of all, there's something very unpleasant about talking about burdening the few. And so I think, and this is where it, what brings me to the topic of my paper, in addition to serving these, to pursuing these two avenues of empowerment, traditional empowerment through representative institutions, this more novel form of empowerment through burdening the few, I think it becomes important for democratic theory and, 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 and students of democracy to ask how citizens, spectating citizens, ordinary citizens, can find some solace vis-a-vis -vis politics, can find some temporary transcendence uh, of the inevitable frustrations besetting political life. Um, and uh, I have as an epigraph to my essay a quote from T.S. Eliot from his poem Ash Wednesday, uh, which says, teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. And I think what I'm talking about here in, this, in, in, in my presentation is the need for democracy not to be limited to its traditional focus on how to care, how to seek popular empowerment, but also to begin to more fully address issues about how not to care. How, how can citizens who are consigned to play the role of spectator 
in a situation that is not fully fair or agreeable, not be demoralized by that circumstance and find some temporary uh, withdrawal from time to time vis-a-vis -vis politics. And so um, this would be the first point, background point I wanted to make, that um, uh, solace is a legitimate democratic need um, because there is uh, uh, an authentic, important uh, de desire that should be respected to sometimes transcend in the right way at the right time the frustrations of a political life that is not adequately inclusive nor adequately fair. The second of my two background points is this. Um, it's that democracy ought to be seen not only as a doctrine of caring, not only as a doctrine of how to realize, say, popular empowerment in the world, but also, surprisingly, as a doctrine of solace, as a source of solace. In other words, there are forms of egalitarianism that actually, paradoxically, generate the transcendence of political energies. What first suggested this idea to me, that egalitarianism can itself be a source of transcending politics, um, uh, and what I'll discuss here, because it, it does speak directly to the theme of this workshop, is uh, the story of Achilles in the Iliad. Um, those of you familiar with Homer's epic will know that Achilles, the greatest warrior on the Greek side, begins the Iliad in a, in a dispute with Agamemnon, the, the leader of the Greek army a dispute over the distribution of, uh, of slave girls, in particular a slave girl, Briseis. And Agamemnon takes from Achilles uh, Briseis, and this leads Achilles to withdraw from war and politics with the Greeks and retreat to his ships, where he spends the first nine books of the Iliad above uh, the war, and po uh, looking down on the Trojan War uh, as a spectator, no longer participating. Um, and what I think is quite arresting and, and, and deep and significant is that once the Greeks realize that they need Achilles back on their side or they're going to lose the war, and they send three emissaries to Achilles to bring back the slave girl Briseis, untouched, and along with that, much else, reparations in the form of land, treasure, titles to rule. So Achilles is being offered what he wanted and so much more, and he still says no. He still refuses to abandon his position of spectatorship. Why? Why does he do this? The usual explanation is that he has become spiteful. He's become angry to a fault. Um, and while I wouldn't want to reject that, that interpretation in a straightforward way, I think what is interesting, if you look closely at the text, is that Achilles is described as happy. And this is not one of his normal traits. When the emissaries come to find Achilles in Book 9, they find him twice described as delighting his heart with a lyre, singing songs of war and warriors and gods. In other words, Achilles has become like Homer. Um, he's become an artist. Uh, he's with his friend Patroclus. He's drinking. He's happy. Uh, he's watching uh, war and politics rather than participating in it. And I think what, what is quite interesting is that when he uh, explains himself, he espouses a democratic ethic. He says, an equal fate to the one who stays behind as to the one who struggles well. In a single honor are held both the low and the high. Death comes alike to the idle person and to the person who works much. And so Achilles' happy spectatorship seems to be grounded on a kind of egalitarianism. We're all the same. All of our lives are equally valid. What's the point then of participating in war and politics? Uh, the level of con concepts divorced from the specific case of, of the Iliad, what I think this story is figuring and illustrating is the strange and paradoxical fact that if you are a radical egalitarian, if you believe that all lives in their substance are equal to each other, equally worthy, equally valuable, equally um, uh, pleasurable uh, or, or rewarding as any other, if you think that the homeless person begging on the street has a life as valuable in its substance as a CEO of a corporation or a prime minister or a president, if you thought this, uh, you might be considered crazy to some degree, but um, you would be unable to think politically. That basic political notions like benefit and harm, profit and loss, justice and injustice would lose their meaning. And so an, a, a radical egalitarianism uh, seems to set the stage for uh, a, 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 a withdrawal of politi from pol politics and, and, and a transcendence of political energies. So with these two background ideas in mind, on the one hand, the need for solace for ordinary citizens as they confront the problem of spectatorship, 
And on the other hand, the suggestion that democracy itself, egalitarianism itself, might be able to provide a certain kind of solace. Let me turn to the main subject matter of my paper, which um, involves uh, the plebeians of late Republican Rome. The plebeians are very important to me. They're sort of the muse of my second book that I'm, I'm finishing up, The Plebeian Addendum to Liberal Democracy. They're also, I think, directly relevant to the theme of this conference because they model a kind of spectatorship. The plebeians of late Republican Rome, on the one hand, were full citizens in the sense that they had juridical equality and the protection of law. And on the other hand, they could vote. They could vote for, for laws and they could vote for leaders. But on the other hand, they were absolutely um, confined into the position of spectatorship insofar as they were prohibited from running for office. They could only vote. They could not run for office. And insofar as they could not speak publicly, they could vote, but they could not deliberate. They could vote, but they could not make speeches. And so the, the plebs were um, forced into a position of a kind of permanent spectatorship vis-a-vis -vis the aristocratic classes who could run for office and could make speeches. So how do the plebeians of ancient Rome deal with the problem of spectatorship? Going back to the three levels that I mentioned in my first point, I think traditional uh, theorists who have emphasized popular or democratic elements of the Roman constitution have said, well, it's through representative institutions, it's through voting that the plebs were able to realize their will. Someone like Fergus Millar, who, who talks about the power of the crowd at Rome, takes very seriously um, political institutions, political assemblies where the plebs could vote as a way to minimize the importance of their spectatorship and, and, and achieve something in, of a more full-fledged political equality. What I find interesting, though, is that the plebeian model also illustrates that second level of empowerment based on burdening the few. What made the Roman Republic a plebeian republic and not just an all-out oligarchy was that, the di was that the differentiation between the few and the many did not only serve to put down the many and raise up the few, but actually had the additional opposite function of regulating the few. What I take to be distinctive of a plebeian republic and what makes it different from a mere oligarchy is just this, that the few and the many are differentiated, but this differentiation serves to regulate and burden the few. So uh, wealthy political people in Rome uh, of the aristocratic classes often had to pay out of their own pocket for the cost of the offices that they managed and, and held. They had to pay for banquets and, and funerals and public monuments and the like. And I think a similar um, situation existed in Athens in the fourth century, which differentiated the few from the many, but put, placed special burdens on the wealthy, uh, made them the, the, the target of special taxes uniquely reserved for them, and also made them have to pay special services or liturgies to the state. Um, however, what I think is most relevant for the, for, for the discussion that I want to uh, do here is that there was a third level, not just these two avenues of empowerment, but there was something like solace. Uh, the, the, the Epicureans, uh, that plebeians from ancient, ancient Rome uh, seem to have been especially drawn to Epicureanism, to Epicurean schools. Uh, Cicero, for example, calls um, Epicureanism a plebeian philosophy. And as a matter of history, it seems that uh, Epicurean schools were unique in trying to popularize their teachings and bring them to a mass audience. I'm not saying that all Epicureans were plebeians or all plebeians were Epicureans. And surely there were other sources of solace for plebeians besides Epicureanism. One could talk about Stoicism, which I don't discuss in this paper. But I do think this, this connection between plebeianism and Epicureanism suggests the way in which uh, plebeian citizens, in addition to seeking empowerment as spectators, also found some solace vis-a-vis -vis politics and some withdrawal from it. So how did Epicureanism offer solace for the politically marginalized? The familiar answer to this question would be to emphasize that Epicureanism taught that a happy life was most likely to be realized outside of politics. Epicureans were hedonists, but, it, but austere hedonists. They believed that we should pursue our pleasure, but if we look closely at things and, uh, and analyze whether something is going to give us pleasure or pain, we'll find that many things we thought would give us pleasure on balance will actually give us net pain. And so the best way to give us pleasure is to probably limit our desires and restrict our desires to what, are, what they would call natural and necessary desires. In any case, the point for here would be this, that the hedonic calculus uh, pursued by uh, Epicureans suggested as a general maxim that it was better to live unnoticed Lathe biosos in Greek, and to avoid politics. It's better, they thought, usually for most people, although there were exceptions, to spend time in private talking convivially with friends in gardens, whether they're actual Epicurean gardens 
in Roman society or more metaphorical gardens of private life, this was the, the most likely source to find happiness as opposed to the pursuit of politics. Politics, Epicureans thought, was the generator of unnecessary and unnatural desires, which on balance were likely to make us unhappy. Desires for fame, for example, for reputation, for great power and great wealth, which Epicureans believed ended up making their seekers, on average, uh, suffer unhappiness and pain. Why? Because if you want these things, uh, you'll be unhappy if you don't get them, and most of us will not get enough of them if we start to want them. And unhappy because even if we do get them, um, we'll have to worry about maintaining them. And furthermore, with regard to political reputation and political power, if you maintain them, you have to suddenly be concerned with the fickle and unreliable and irrational preferences of a mass of other people. And this is a sort of a block against your self-sufficiency. Uh, more deeply, Epicureans argued that politics represses the fact of our finitude, the fact of our mortality. And the fear of death for Epicureans is the primary generator of unnecessary and unnatural desires. Whether or not um, uh, Epicureans are precisely right about this, I think it's a deep and true point that politics is really guilty of repressing our mortality. It's not just following Hannah Arendt that one thing that political life seems to offer to those at, at the highest echelons of power is the promise of a kind of remembrance of immortality. Uh, but states, unlike individual human beings, are not obviously fated to die. When their ends will come are much more unpredictable. States can go on living for centuries. And so in these two ways, trying to get remembered through politics and affiliating ourselves with beings, with political states that, that don't obviously die, we Epicureans might say um, fail to recognize or escape from, badly escape from, impossibly escape from our mortality and take on these unnecessary and unnatural desires that are more likely to make us unhappy than happy. So the idea would be if you're a mere spectator of politics, a plebeian, someone marginal, guess what? Uh, you're no less likely to be unhappy than a politician and in fact you may have a greater chance for happiness. Now this is a pretty familiar account of Epicureanism and the kind of solace it provides. It's also not likely to be terribly convincing to those of us skeptical that pleasure or happiness should be our highest consideration or skeptical that the Epicureans have uniquely cracked the code on how to be happy. I think modern people are much more skeptical that there is a clear and direct science of how to be happy and to the extent we can learn to be happy, there are diverse paths to happiness. To expect that one school of thought, the Epicureans knew and uniquely knew how to be happy is something I'm guessing many people in this room will find um, of more antiquarian interest than of having a direct relevance to contemporary politics. Um, but beyond this familiar account of Epicureanism, I tried to emphasize another element uh, of the solace Epicureans likely provided to plebeians, of that Epicureanism likely provided, provided to plebeians, to those fated to lead largely spectatorial political lives. And this is that Epicurean practices ought to be seen as having an egalitarian character. In emphasizing the egalitarianism of Epicureanism, I don't simply mean to refer to the membership of Epicure Epicurean communities, which were very open, which included uh, uh, both elite and non-elite citizens, as well as non-citizens, including slaves and women. I don't just simply mean in emphasizing the egalitarianism of Epicureanism to note that to the extent Epicureans did have a political theory, it was a proto-contractarian account of justice, which defined justice not as something existing in nature, but as something that individuals come together to contract to, agree to, and agree uh, the tr for terms of non-harming each other. What I really want to emphasize is how certain practices of Epicureans, even as they were outside of politics, still could be seen as a sublimated form of egalitarian commitments and practices. That what's interesting me about the Epicureans and Epicureanism, and as it was practiced in late Republican Rome, is that some of the ideas and practices could be interpreted as a reconfigured, a reconfiguring of certain democratic uh, commitments and practices even as they were uh, going on outside of political institutions, outside of conventional democracy. And so I'll give you three examples of this. Um, one of these would be the way in which Epicureans uh, retranslate solidarity so it no longer refers to civic relations but instead refers to intimate relationships of friendship. As the Epicureans taught, and this is one of the central uh, core maxims uh, from Epicurus, of those things which wisdom provides for the blessedness of one's whole life, by far the greatest is the possession of friendship. Epicureans were not, of course, alone in praising friendship, 
as it was a recurring idea in Greek philosophy that fellow citizens in a well-ordered polis would be friends, but they departed from conventional approaches when they sharply differentiated civic friendship, the kind of solidarity occurring between co-participants in governmental and lawmaking processes, from what they considered the more genuine friendship between private individuals. Philodemus, a leading teacher of Epicureanism and an Epicurean poet in late Republican Rome could write, if a person undertook a systematic inquiry to find out what is most hostile to friendship and most productive of enmity, this person would find it in the city. So the city is not a source of intimate friendship. Um, and to find intimate friendship, one has to leave the city. Uh, and in so doing, I would suggest one is not altogether abandoning a political ideal, an ideal of solidarity, but translating it, retranslating it in non-political form. Similar, we could, similarly, we can talk about the phenomenon of free speech. What is free speech? Normally, I think we think of free speech as a political right to say what one wants in a political sphere without the fear of punishment. But for the Epicureans, it's a more literal and I think deeper notion of free speech, a freeing of speech from the need to make arguments, a freeing of speech from the constraints of politeness or formality, a freeing of speech from inhibition, and so a saying what we truly think and revealing our intimate thoughts and, and, and ideas. Uh, I think we can see this translation of political free speech to the freeing of speech from politics to a more intimate speech in the way that Epicureans retranslated the Greek idea of parisia, or free speech. Initially, parisia has a political meaning of the right to free speech to address fellow citizens in public settings. In the Hellenistic context, it becomes increasingly about candid and frank speech but still has a mostly political significance. In other words, um, the way you differentiate a, a genuine uh, supporter from a flatterer in a hierarchical society is that your friend, your supporter, will engage in frank speech and criticize you. With the Epicureans, the idea of free speech is even more stripped of political function, as Parisia indicates for them, above all, the value of speaking truly and deeply with one's friends, often for the sake of philosophical inquiry or the moral reform of participants in the discussion. And so Philodemus, again, puts it this way, even if we demonstrate logically that although many fine things result from friendship, there is nothing so grand as having one to whom one will say one's heart and, one will, and who will listen when one speaks. I'll just say that again. There is nothing so grand as having one to whom one will say what is in one's heart and who will listen when one speaks, for our nature strongly desires to reveal to some people what it thinks. And I think it's in this respect of freeing speech that we should consider the Epicurean ideal of wine drinking and light inebriation. This is a practice that has very little functionality, I think, in formal political bodies, but is relevant, I think, if, if but what we mean by free speech is you know, freeing ourselves from inhibitions and saying what we genuinely think and sharing our private thoughts with each other. And so a third and final example I'll put forward of this translation of political values, of egalitarian values, in non-political directions would involve the way that uh, Epicureans consider self-sufficiency or autarkia. Um, ar arguably the primary meaning of autarkia prior to Epicurus was as a political notion. With Aristotle, for example, autarkia usually is presented as a feature of a city-state capable of, capable of living on its own, or if it does designate an individual's own independence, it is an independence that is secured either through a robust political regime, an abundant amount of wealth, or a well-ordered marketplace facilitating trade. That is to say, although there are some exceptions, within Aristotle's account, autarkia is primarily a quality that either refers to or is ensured by political and socioeconomic structures. With the Epicureans, by contrast, autarkia is continually theorized as a quality of persons rather than econ economies and states, and as a quality, furthermore, that is usually best achieved through the internal regulation of wants than through political and economic institutions. To be sure, Ep Epicureans do note the importance of some political institutions and, and wealth as being conducive to self-sufficiency, and they don't mean to oppose all interest in those things. But their major focus is to explain, on the one hand, how autarkia can be attained without great wealth or power, and on the other hand, how the active pursuit of wealth and power could erode autarkia. So in these three ways, the translation of solidarity into friendship, of free speech into intimate conversation, of self-sufficiency into the regulation of one's wants, I think Epicureanism not only provided a kind of solace to ordinary spectating plebeian citizens, but did so in a way that appropriated democratic 
and egalitarian practices in a non-political direction. I'll make my concluding point now and anticipate perhaps a one type of criticism some will have. And this may be that this type of thinking, um, Epicureanism specifically, and perhaps more generally the search for solace, is irresponsible. Um, certainly this is what Cicero claimed. Cicero was a great critic of Epicureans, and he argued that um, a well-ordered state requires civic virtue, the commitment of citizens to be active engagers in their public life, and Epicureans, in challenging that to some degree, threatened to uh, corrode the foundations of a, a well-ordered republic. And this idea that Epicureanism is irresponsible is repeated throughout the history of political thought among p Republican thinkers. One finds it, for example, in Montesquieu, as well as uh, it's a frequent trope among the founders of the American Republic in the 18th century. Um, but I'd like to respond to this critique uh, by making two brief uh, points. Um, first would be this. Uh, if we could all be Cicero, if we could all be consul, if we could all be a senator, then perhaps this criticism would have more uh, force to it. But I don't think we can, and I think the fact that we can't, the fact that most of us are consigned to play the role of spectator and to be marginal, makes it permissible to begin to ask how to find solace, and makes it permissible to look for, for ancient philosophies of solace with, in a spirit of finding some guidance. I think that the Epicurean maxim, live unnoticed, latte biosas, should not only be read as a call to do this, but as a condition that we're all going to have to endure. It's not just that we should all try to live unnoticed, it's that we, most of us will live unnoticed, like it or not. And so therefore it becomes, I think, a legitimate project for democratic theory to ask how we as citizens can endure that difficulty and, and not all the time um, be frustrated by it. Second, I don't think um, the effort to find solace from politics is mutually exclusive with the effort to find empowerment within it. I think we can do both, both look to realize democracy in conventional institutional ways and look to find solace from time to time in transcendence of politics. As a historical point, I think it's interesting to point out that the Epicureans, even as they preached withdrawal from politics, very many of them at least, were engaged in politics. Um, and uh, I think the Epicurean gardens were less a way to once and for all escape society as a way to temporarily <coughs> withdraw and find some, some relaxation from the stresses of political life, if only to return to them later. And in our own time, I think there's enough time in the day both to engage in politics and to figure out how to transcend it from time to time. I would again return to the T.S. Eliot quote with which I began, teach us to care and not to care, teach us to sit still. And I think my larger takeaway point that I'm trying to make in this paper is that democracy has something to say in both respects. Democracy is not just how we should care about politics, what we should expect from it, what our notions of justice should be. But it's also, I think, has resources for providing a kind of solace uh, and, and transcendence uh, of politics from time to time. Thank you. Matthew Festenstein, who was originally um, um, scheduled to give a comment, had uh, very uh, recently uh, had to cancel his uh, participation, so I needed to jump in and um, I'm going to pre prepare a comment myself. Um, I need to apologize in advance for a, perhaps a bit unstructured uh, thoughts that I have on Jeff's paper. Um, and I should also uh, say from the beginning that um, I don't know whether you know this, Jeff, but in, in this country, in the UK, um, one could actually lose one's job when allegedly using the word plebs, you know, in the public sphere, <laughs> as has recently happened with the Conservative uh, Chief Whip, Andrew Mitchell, in 2012. So let's hope this will not be a second plebgate. Um, <laughs> Um, and let's just go into the discussion. So my, my comments will mostly uh, revolve around the big picture um, and not about the argument's more intricate elements. Um, I will also uh, draw on some external resources um, from uh, Gramsci to Arendt to call into question some of Jeff's basic assumptions about democracy. So this might perhaps, and I hope it will not be, but it might smack a little bit of unfair criticism, but I hope Jeff will accept my observations uh, as very friendly contestations to which he will certainly manage to offer plausible replies. So the first comment is um, about the relationship between realism and pessimism. I think Jeff's overall view of politics can be termed as realistic. He repudiates um, in the paper idealizing versions of democracy by emphasizing the sustained existence of plebeian life in our world. The focus is decidedly on actual citizens and their troubles, not on citizens how we hope they could be. As with any realist theory of politics, there is, however, always a danger 
that it transforms itself into full-fledged pessimism. At one point, we find Jeff, for instance, reflecting on the darkness of political life, to which only the withdrawal of Epicureans can provide a rejoinder. Consider as an alternative starting point Gramsci's famous account of the revolutionary process, and I quote here, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, a saying he attributed, perhaps wrongly, to his friend Romain Roland. Gramsci's idea is really simple. Pessimism of the intellect means that we need to coolly recognize the brutality of present circumstances, aptly summarized, I think, by Jeff's description of the vicissitudes of plebeianism. But for anybody committed to progressive politics, the story cannot end here. And I would also suggest that even if you are a realist about politics, the story shouldn't end here. So optimism of the will signifies the necessary belief in human potentialities to transcend our current predicament, plebeian or otherwise. Realism cautions us that the success of pro progressive politics will not be quick and easy, but it doesn't commit us to a fatalist acceptance of our fate. So being entangled in, uh, in an oppressive life world, I think, is not the same as being entrapped in it. If we accept the current predicament as our fate, social criticism becomes, to a certain degree, impossible. Or rather, the modicum of, of, of Epicureanism turns out to be the only option left for plebeians, as Jeff uh, just argued, to live a life uh, worth living. So I'm not 100% sure I can fully accept this outlook um, of a modicum. I think the fear is that Jeff's pessimistically tinged realism might undermine the very basis on which all active engagement draws. To put my concern in the form of a question, is there a space of politi for political hope in Jeff's theory? I'm of course aware that Jeff attempts to refute the charge of defeatism at the end of the chapter, and he just talked about this at the end of his presentation, but I must confess that his realism might still be accused of being unrealistic precisely in its seeming denial of hope for politics. So I might of course be wrong about this point and perhaps Epicureanism itself contains a philosophy of hope, but then I think it would be extra political, not political hope that animates plebeians. So my second point is to do with uh, the real life of political activism. Um, and it's somewhat related to the issue about realism and pessimism. Given Jeff's rather bleak view of actually existing democracy, as it is practiced today, I would like to ask what we should think of political activism in the real world and of other experiences of democratic agency outside of the Western sphere of influence. So I'm in complete agreement with Jeff when he diagnoses the many frustrations disenfranchised ordinary citizens, plebeians in Jeff's terminology, suffer today. But then we can also think about relevant counterexamples of those who feel passionate about politics without necessarily being part of a patrician elite. Where do these political activists fit in Jeff's account of democracy? I think there are really only two possibilities if we start from a general theory of plebeianism, as I think Jeff does. Either we must admit that political activists are, after all, not so different from the patrician elite. They just dress up their particular interests in a more sophisticated garb. Indeed, some of the criticism of the Occupy movement, for example, has shrewdly suggested that its main proponents were mostly white middle-class kids who were ver really very terribly worried about the huge student debt without caring all too much about the structural injustices in the world. Or, on the other hand, again starting from a general theory of plebeianism, we would have to say that political activists are self-delusional to the extreme. In other words, that they firmly believe um, they can change something which is inescapably out of their control. According to this viewpoint, the members of the Occupy movement, again for example, are plebeians who wrongly think they can create a world without plebeians. The objection of naivety uh, has naturally been raised many times against all kinds of social movements. However, perhaps both approaches are fundamentally flawed in that they don't take seriously how political activists themselves perceive their work. While a certain amount of naivety is probably essential for any form of active engagement in politics, I think we shouldn't condemn all types of activism as delusional. So to give my concern a more constructive spin, allow me to formulate again a question. What can a general theory of plebeianism say about those who are de facto only ordinary disenfranchised citizens, but who strive often passionately and against all odds against the current predicament? 
This question is important, I think, because it expresses a worry about the social imaginary animating Jeff's account of plebeianism. The thought might be that Jeff's bleak depiction of politics is premised upon a rather specific, locally circumscribed notion of actually existing democracy, that of the United States of America. It might well be the case that the experience of being a spectator to politics is all too uh, common in American politics, as, as it is actually in many other highly developed countries. But what about other parts of the world where politics might be experienced much more viscerally with more pride and horribile dictu, even delight. I'm here not only thinking about the uprisings of the Arab Spring, which might uh, have failed partially, of course, but also about social movements in South America, where not everybody would probably identify with the social ima imaginary invoked uh, by Jeff. Think also, and in particular, about democratic agency in India, where, as Mukulika <coughs> Banerjee has recently shown in her anthropological study, Why India Votes, it is precisely the largely illiterate, disenfranchised masses who hold up high democratic ideals. Voting there is as much about recognition of their status as equals as it is about the expression of political preferences. There, the inked finger, sometimes the middle finger, uh, the visible proof that one has actually cast a vote, even becomes a signal of peer pressure. If you don't vote, you will get ostracized. Now contrast this with the general uh, fatigue with and exhaustion through democracy in the West, which forms actually the backdrop, I think, of Jeff's player for Epicureanism. So paradoxically, the experience of plebeian suffering from politics might be prevalent only in the most developed societies, but not in those who we normally, that we normally consider less developed. So the, the third point that I want to raise is to do with extra politicism, a point that Jeff hasn't elaborated on in his presentation, but is a very crucial element in his, in his paper. So I think Jeff very clearly rejects upo utopianism of one kind, namely the wishful thinking of those who conceive of civic action as always meaningful and as always effectual. But I think there's also a utopian streak to his own depiction of Epicureanism, the way how he sketches the life world of extra political animals um, could be construed as a form of wishful thinking, I think. Let's unpack this a little bit by looking more closely at the idea of extra politicism, which is crucial to the argument. And in the paper, uh, Jeff makes a distinction between apoliticism, anti politicism, and extra politicism. And the argument um, is that uh, Epicureanism can be a cure in the vein of. Uh, extra politicism, a, a, a temporal withdrawal from politics that includes a return to politics. So it's absolutely crucial for Jeff um, that the line between apoliticism, somebody who just doesn't care about politics, anti-politicism, somebody who is, I mean, openly hostile to politics, and extra politicism can be drawn simply and sharply. But the worry, I think, is that the very definition of extra politicism, the temporal withdrawal from politics, is liable to corruption. The problem to me seems to be the following. How can Jeff's proposal assure us that one doesn't lead to the other, that the extra political ple <coughs> pleasures of plebeians do not turn into an A or anti-political apathy and cynicism, even hatred? Analytically, I think the distinction between apoliticism and anti-politicism and extra-politicism is brilliant. It's set up in a coherent fashion. It's very original. But it's not entirely clear whether there are bulwarks uh, in place to stop um, temporarily constrained extra politicism from sliding into the more dangerous forms of apoliticism or anti politicism. I think this question of limits between these three types of negative reaction to politics is central because it touches on the very complicated relationship between active engagement and critical indifference, another uh, original phrase in the paper. So, should we conceive of these two forms of of political, extra-political action as complementary or rather as mutually exclusive. When reading the chapter and in the presentation at the end you made it very clear that you think they are complementary, I was still not 100% sure how we can make them work together. Uh, this is the kind of question about how we can relate um, extra-politicism to anti-politicism. My fourth point is to do with uh, a possible degeneration from therapy to addiction. <laughs> So Jeff presents Epicureanism, as a several point, as a tonic to ease the strains imposed on plebeians. And the addiction of therapy and cure is very prominent throughout the chapter. 
Uh, I think it's necessary for Jeff's proposal that Epicureanism serves as a remedy to the ills of dark politics. Otherwise, we would be dealing with a completely nihilistic account of politics with no prospects of redemption or solace at all. However, both uh, semantically and logically, I'm not entirely convinced uh, this diction um, of cure therapy actually describes what is at stake with Epicureanism. Perhaps palliative or painkiller would be more appropriate descriptions because it's quite evident from Jeff's uh, narrative that no end to the fate of plebeians is an immediate sight. Ultimately, the proposal appears to be about relieving pressures and burdens, not about curing the disease. It's about numbing the nerve and not pulling the tooth, so to say. But the, ta but the danger, of course, with painkillers, we know that now, is that they can become addictive. You can get addicted to painkillers. So what assurances do we have that the temporal withdrawal from politics doesn't transform into a permanent isolation? Perhaps the warm feeling of withdrawal will turn into an enduring addiction that could be very hard to overcome. I've made this point already, but it might be worthwhile underlining. What incentives do plebeians have to return to the gritty political forum once they have left it behind to indulge in the pleasures of extra politicism, in the hedonic pleasures of extra politicism? What will make them enter again the darkness of politics once they have tasted the also sweet fruits of friendship and philosophical discussion in the Epicurean garden? For extra politicism to be a convincing alternative to the unworldly enthusiasm of deliberate Democrats, deliberative Democrats, for example, there must be some positive outlook for citizens to leave the government.